Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here. My name is John Hamry. I'm the president at CSIS. And uh, before, when we have public events, before we begin, we always start with a little bit of a safety announcement. If there's any emergency, I'm your responsible safety officer, so I would ask you to follow me. I'm the person that's going to keep you well and safe. If we have to escape, evacuate, we're going to get behind, we'll move, we'll kick over those cameras, we'll get them out of the way. The, the exit's around the side, we go right out through the exit in the first ground level. If our problem is in the front, we're going to go around to the National Geographic. If the problem is in the back, we're going to go across the street to the park. And I'm going to do a head count and I'm going to make sure everybody's well. So, okay, just follow me if we have to do anything. Uh, it's a real privilege to... Uh, welcome Senator Patrick Leahy and Marcel. Mar now, I will just tell you, this is a rare event, folks. When Marcel comes to something, you know it's important, okay? <laughs> and I'm so glad. It's, this is one of the few states where we've got three senators and we only have to pay for two of them. And we are fortunate enough to have Marcel fully devoted to public life and everything that she's done. It's been wonderful. Uh, America has a bad habit of wanting to walk away from our messes. And we left a mess in Vietnam. And I think it's Senator Pat Leahy who has said that this isn't right. This is something that America has to tend to. It's our responsibility. It may be too late, but well, it's never too late. It is late, but it's not too late. And it does reflect a commitment that we must honor. And I think Senator Leahy should be thanked by all of us for keeping our national consciousness awake to this problem. Um, just a little vignette, which I think gives you an insight into the content of his character. Uh, Senator Leahy and Marcel were uh, in Vietnam recently, and in part to track down what was the human tragedy associated with the use of dioxin and Agent Orange. Um, they've never admitted this, but they went to a family that had two children that are to this day badly disabled, and they've never wanted that known. I want you to know it, because I want you to know the kind of character. This isn't a theoretical issue for the Leahy's. This is a personal issue. And their commitment on behalf of America is something that we have to honor. We thank them for their courage. We thank them for their conviction to make this a priority for all of us. I will tell you, Senator Leahy has a vote at 11 o'clock. He's going to have to leave. He won't be able to take questions, unfortunately. So let me ask, with your applause, would you please welcome Senator Patrick Leahy. John, thank you so much. You know, I've heard at different meetings here and, uh, and also we had the big uh, luncheon during the Alfalfa Club here. I've heard John give that instruction about if there's danger or something, just follow him. John, I've been following you for years, so I'm perfectly willing. I'm perfectly willing to do that. And uh, I'm also so happy that, that uh, Charles Bailey is here. You know, Charles did such extraordinary work on Agent Orange at the Ford Foundation, and that makes it possible for us to be here. And I want to acknowledge Tim Reeser, who's here. A lot of you know Tim. When he started in my office, he was six foot five, 250 pounds. And look how we've worn him down. <laughs> well, and he was in Vietnam just a, um, a few months ago and also stopped in in uh, Seoul to visit our, our ambassador there, Mark Lippert, who used to work for me and was savagely attacked uh, by a knife-wielding person. And then we have uh, Lake, Lake Son, and I hope I pronounced that, uh, who's been a leader on the Vietnamese side, and I thank him. I first started in this issue of disabilities in Vietnam with George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush. And, and let me tell you a story. Uh, President Bush, after General Vesey had been over doing the POW MIA with the Vietnamese, he said, we've got to do something to show some goodwill toward the Vietnamese. How about using the Leahy War Victims Fund over there and for people who've lost limbs and disabilities and so on? And I said, good idea, let's do that. So we did. 
and uh, went over, uh, uh, Marcel and I, Marcel was a registered nurse, so technically wanted her there. We went over with John Glenn and his wife and some others. I'll never forget the very, very hot day. We're at the first side of the Leahy War Victims Fund. You had some men who'd been crawling on the ground since the war. They'd lost their legs. They're now getting wheelchairs. The Vietnamese authorities were speaking in Vietnamese about what this was. And every so on, you go on Vietnamese, and I hear the Patrick Leahy, Patrick Leahy. And one man is just staring at me. I thought, I'm an American, I'm a big guy, he must hate me. And they, uh, when they finished, they said, would you go and pick him up and put him in his wheelchair? And Marcel was whispering to me, <laughs> as, as a nurse would, how best to pick him up without injuring him. So I picked him up, all the time he was just staring at me. I put him in the wheelchair, I started to get up, he grabbed my shirt, pulled me down and kissed me. Now, uh, this day I get choked up, and when we were in Da Nang, Tim, we walked in and saw the picture at the reception. There's that man, and both Marcel and I were choked up at that time. Now, at that time, our focus was on victims of unexploded landmines and bombs, and there are such a huge number. The Leahy war victims Fund became the first USA to the Vietnamese people after the war. Now that was back in 1989. And since then, the Lay Fund has helped thousands of Vietnamese war victims who have lost their legs and arms, regained their mobility and their independence with artificial limbs and wheelchairs and vocational training using limbs, wheelchairs, and all made in Vietnam by Vietnamese. The U.S. government has also provided millions of dollars to help clear unexploded ordnance from Vietnam. You know, it's not just in Vietnam, but everywhere else, a cruel legacy of war. So the soldiers leave, the armies leave, peace is declared, guns are silent, but civilians, often children, continue to die from landmines and shells and bombs years later. Uh, because they explode. The armies are gone. The weapons of destruction are still there. So I hope that the programs we've worked on have helped with the normalization of relations with Vietnam. And I was thinking that when we were there last year. Last year? This year? Last year. Um, over the past 25 years, we tried to use efforts to improve relations with the Vietnamese people and their government, from the Fulbright and international visitors programs to combating HIV AIDS and maritime security cooperation with the Vietnamese Navy, which has become, as you know, a very significant point. And I think it's helped transform our engagement with Vietnam since 1995, when President Clinton with strong support of many in this room, myself included, reestablish diplomatic relations. And they further our strategic interests in East Asia. But there's one issue that remains a great resentment, and that's Agent Orange. I recall in my meetings with Vietnamese officials, they mentioned their support for the programs to remove unexpl uh, unexploded ordnance, the, the use of the Lay War Victims Fund, but then they bring up Agent Orange. John, the tenor of those meetings would change at that point. They would insist the United States should take care of the victims of Agent Orange, whom they, whom they numbered in the millions, and clean up the areas that were contaminated with dioxin. They always brought up. They're not shy about, about it, and I encourage it because it was hard to argue with it. If Agent Orange contaminated dioxin were sprayed today over inhabited areas and rice fields, as was in Vietnam back then, many would declare it a war crime. I thought we had a moral obligation to do something about it, but there were two big obstacles. First, our government, the U.S. government, refused to accept 
any responsibility, fearing that would encourage thousands or even millions of legal claims by Vietnamese citizens for reparations. And secondly, the Vietnamese government originally argued that seemingly anyone in Vietnam who suffered a birth defect was a victim of Agent Orange in large parts of the country main contaminated. Well, two things got us over that. First, Charles Bailey at the Ford Foundation funded a survey, and this, Charles, I can't thank you enough for this. It showed that contamination was limited to a few docks and hot spots at former U.S. military bases, and that dramatically uh, limited the areas to be cleaned up. Secondly, the U.S. government began providing compensation to American victims, veterans who were exposed to Agent Orange and were suffering serious illness. And about the same time, a U.S. court uh, dismissed a case brought on behalf of Vietnamese citizens who claimed damage for exposure to Agent Orange. Now, some would say the causal connection between dioxin and Agent Orange a specific disease has not been proven, but I said we cannot have a double standard in our approach to U.S. veterans versus Vietnamese citizens. So Agent Orange disability payments to U.S. veterans of the Vietnam War are in the billions of dollars. And now we're also talking about it to U.S. Air Force Reservists. But I want to turn Agent Orange from being a symbol of antagonism and resentment into an area where the U.S. and the Vietnamese government could work together. So over the past seven years, the Congress, often with legislation I've written, has provided $105 million to clean up the Da Nang Airport, which had formerly been a U.S. military base, another $30 million for health disability programs focused on likely Agent Orange victims. And last year, I joined Vietnam's Vice Minister of Defense, who has since come and visited me in my office, and our U.S. Ambassador, in activating the heaters to destroy the dioxin in the first 45,000 cubic meters of contaminated soil at Da Nang. This thing is huge, and apparently it's working. But then, I said, and I wanted to do this with no press or nobody around. Marcel and I wanted to visit a family with, and this is where I follow the, the nurse with her, her abilities and her conscience. And we went there, and we saw two young boys. They could have been the age of a couple of our grandchildren, badly disabled. And we'd helped change the modest house that they were living in so that they, uh, parents were getting older, would not have to carry them upstairs and all that. But I thought, oh my God, how would I react if this were not one but two children in my family who had this? And then we went to a local hospital Again, people wanted big speeches. I said, let's not have any speeches. It's a hot day. Let's give these children and others who are suffering from disabilities the wheelchairs and hearing aids, which is very interesting. They had gotten from the U.S. government. And Marcel and Tim will remember, and JP, I think of this often, a couple of those children, they put the hearing aids in. Their parents spoke to them, and they heard them for the first time. This is a pretty remarkable. These are things we take for granted, but they couldn't. So we've come a long way. We have a further way to go. Bienwa Airport, the survey, that's under way. It's going to show more extensive dioxin contamination in Da Nang. I've urged the Department of Defense to help pay for the uh, cost of this effort because it's in their interest to work with their Vietnamese military counterparts to address it. 
USAID is to expand the health disability program to $21 million over five years and up to eight provinces that were heavily sprayed. Well, these are our steps, but we have to do a lot more. President George W. Bush, President Obama, Secretary of State Clinton and Kerry have made clear the U.S. and Vietnam are partners in addressing the dioxin issue. We learned a great deal about how social services can help children and adults with disabilities, ways to boost their families because the families carry the greatest burden of daily care and responsibility. And if their children at some time the parents will no longer be there to care for them. Now, we can't lift all the problems there, but we can work far more together to do it. Ambassador, I want you to know that as long as I'm in the Senate, I'm committed, uh, strongly committed, to help that cooperation. Because the Vietnam War is a terrible tragedy for the people of both countries for the veterans, for their families, for millions of others who are harmed directly or indirectly. And often overlooked are the millions of U.S. cluster munitions in Laos that continue to maim and kill civilians 40 years later. That's another legacy of the Vietnam War, as John, as you know. We're providing funds to get rid of them. So we can talk about these painful legacies but I think as I conclude, let's have some satisfaction the U.S. and Vietnam are finally doing things together. Finally, the people there, and I'll tell you one story again. I was at meetings with all the officials. A friend of ours, Hal, lives in, uh, in Hanoi, said to Marcel, let's go for tour around here. Now, those of you know what traffic is like in Hanoi. She goes up with her motor scooter. The two of them hop on the motor scooter. And off they go in this swarm. Uh, I mean, it, it looks like schools of fish as they hit uh, intersection. And I recall telling your president that um, Marcel was on that scooter and he Asked the translator, what did he really say? And I, told, and I showed him the picture of her, which got passed around to every official there. And I was no longer the important person. My wife was willing to go out on annoyed traffic. Little did they know how much I was worried during that time. But this would have been inconceivable just a few years ago. We are working together. At a time when China is actively seeking to extend its sphere of influence and the United States has begun its own rebalance toward Asia, these Vietnam legacy programs have taken on added significance. Vietnam's highest ranking government official, the Secretary General of the Communist Party, is due to meet with President Obama and myself and other members of Congress in two weeks. We wouldn't have thought of such a trip a few a visit a few years ago. And I believe the chairman, JP, the chairman of the National Assembly is going to visit here in September. There's talk of President Obama possibly visiting Vietnam. And I've talked with the president about that several times. And we're seeing how the next generation of Vietnamese who embrace any opportunity, become versed in regional and global issues, are eager to take on new responsibilities. I visited the students of the law school in Hanoi last year. I looked at these young people, Ambassador, this is the future of your country. You can be so extraordinarily proud of the young men and young women I saw there and the questions they asked and the interest they had. So it's a long time from lifting that man into a wheelchair, but the arc in this case, the arc of history has gone in the right direction, and I thank all of you. And now I'm going to head to a vote. <laughs> So
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to thank uh, the Senator for that, that great speech and, and for kicking us off in, in exactly the right tone. It's now my pleasure. I, I should introduce myself. I'm Ernie Bauer. I'm the chair for Southeast Asian Studies here at, at CSIS. Um, it's my pleasure to invite uh, our next speaker to the podium. His name is Ambassador Pham, uh, Pham Quan Vinh, and uh, he is the fifth uh, Vietnamese ambassador to the United States in our 20 years of uh, diplomatic relations that are being celebrated this year, as, as the Senator noted. The, the ambassador uh, has the rank of senior ambassador, which is sort of the diplomatic equivalent of a five-star general in, in Vietnam. He is uh, one of the, the highest ranking uh, of the career foreign service. And um, having worked with him, I can see very clearly why uh, he was promoted to that rank. He's a, he's a terrific diplomat. He knows Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific very well, having been Deputy Foreign Minister before coming here in charge of ASEAN, South Asia, and the Pacific Affairs. Um, and so I hope you'll join me in welcoming uh, Ambassador uh, Ving. Thank you very much, Anib Mao. And thank you, CSIS, and all of you for attending this significant event. Actually, 40 years have passed since the end of the war, but we are talking about an issue which is of great humanitarian nature. All of us has a common sense of humanitarian nature. We are very much happy to have Honorable Senator Patrick Leahy to be with us to kick off our discussions. And this is very much significant also. Uh, Senator Patrick Leahy has been pioneering and championing uh, the healing of the wounds of war between our two countries. And he has been very much involved proactively in this general exercise of helping the victims, especially with the establishment of the War Victims Fund since 1989. Actually, to us in Vietnam, Senator Patrick Leahy has been both a statement and a great friend of the ordinary people. He has been to Vietnam many times uh, for the policy uh, issues on making our partnership to be a greater pride, and at the same time to helping the victims of the wars, including uh, those are affected by Asian Orange and Dioxin. It has been great support from him that we have now our joint venture in this exercise. So uh, I would like to express on behalf of the government of Vietnam the words of great appreciation for Patrick Leahy and for all those who have been working with us in helping uh, the victims of the war in Vietnam. As you may have known, the war in Vietnam has been so much devastating and the consequences continue until now, especially the effects of the Agent Orange dioxin and unexploded ordinances. All are there. It has the effects on the environment and it has more effects, especially on the people. And especially if you consider the dioxin and Agent Orange, you will see the effects not for those who have been exposed to the Agent Orange and dioxin, but also for the offsprings. And you consider in the family that Senator uh, Patrick Lee has just mentioned, has two children, deformed children and no offspring in our traditional uh, nature of the family that we need children to be a next generation of ours. So this is, and I also share the views that we need to tell the truth. We need to take responsibility and we need to work together out of the common sense of humanities, humanitarian nature. This is what we have been doing. And uh, 
for the part, on the part of the government of Vietnam, we have been working hard to overcome the consequences of the war since the end of the war. And on this very issue of the Asian orange and dioxin, the government of Vietnam has spent at the national level every year 45 million US dollars for this purpose. But we have also mobilized at the provincial level and at the social level uh, with all the associations and the people helping in this exercise. And we have been working closely with international partners. And we have uh, Chas Baylor representing at that point in time Food Federation. We have been working very hard. And thank you very much for your engagement and dedication to this issue, Chas. And we have a national program for both two issues as a legacy of the war, that is, uh, the landmines and the unexploded ordinance, and the other, also a national uh, commission, overseeing uh, this one, the Asian orange and dioxin. And we have mobilized the forces of all the society, including the responsibility and uh, the dedication of the government as well. And we had hope in working with the US, in working with other international partners, we can complete basically, uh, or we can meet basically the target of cleaning up the dioxin and Asian orange between now and the year 2020. But it's much more than that. It, that target is very difficult to get, and we need more uh, assistance. And between Vietnam and the US, certainly uh, Senator Patrick Lee has mentioned that we have some difficulties in, uh, in talking with each other at first, but later on, out of the sense of uh, humanitarian nature, we have been working, we have a dialogue, we have people involved in on how we can form some, some form of uh, joint ventures in this one. And Senator Patrick, he was those among the pioneering that have been helping on this one. And I just give a few uh, figures to highlight the partnership that we have in this one. Number one, <coughs> in the joint uh, declaration or statement at the higher levels of our leadership, we only highlight that overcoming the legacy of the war will be a priority for both countries, both governments, including in the joint statement on the comprehensive partnership that adopted by President Obama and my president, Chiang Ten San, two years ago, 2013. And uh, since mid-2000s, the Congress of the US has been involved in this one by uh, giving some fund uh, to the program for assisting us in overcoming the uh, legacies of war, including in uh, the area of Asian origin and dioxin. And it, the fund has been increased every year since then. And uh, it is now, I, I have the figure, maybe about 22.5 million US dollars for this year. And the, we have a brick project in Da Nang that Patrick Lee, he was there uh, April last year in turning on uh, the project on decontamination or cleaning up in the area, especially the airport of Da Nang. And it's totaled about uh, 10, 84 million US dollars for the total project. And the government of Vietnam has been very much appreciative of the US assistance between 2007 and now, 2015, about, as uh, Senator Patrick Lee has mentioned, about 130 million US, US dollars has been uh, reserved uh, for the project of uh, uh, cleaning up uh, Asian Orange and helping people victims of that Asian Orange. The government of Vietnam has been working hard together with the US. And we do share that our future work still very much heavy, and we have a lot of work to do. 
including in the project in Da Nang that we have, it need, because study is so awesome, we need greater efforts, but there are other areas. We have identified 28 areas, especially focusing on the 17 areas, including the airport of Bien Hoa, for example. And the people need more help also. If you see out of the total funding from the US for the environment and for the people, it usually one third of the total amount of funding, or very recently the current program, about half of the funding for the people, while uh, the funding for uh, the environment, cleaning up the environment is greater. Certainly both areas of helping the victims for the environment, for the land reclamation, and for the people affected by the Asian Orient are both equally important. So on part of the government of Vietnam, we call all of you, including the, part, the Congress and the government of the US, uh, to work together with Vietnam, uh, to work together with us, to further expand and to further deepen our partnership in this uh, program uh, uh, to overcome the effects of Asian Orange and Dioxin out of the sense of uh, humanitarian nature and responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. The ambassador has time for a couple questions, so I'd like to uh, just ask you to identify yourself and your institution if you have a question, and uh, we'll open the floor. Uh, to the gentleman in the back here. My name is Morton Sklar. Oh, thank you. My name is Morton Sklar. I'm with the human rights group called Human Rights USA. I'm retired now. Uh, my question for the ambassador is, as a member of the, former member of the United States military during the Vietnam War, I share all the concerns and emphasis that needs to be placed on reconciliation. At the same time, I have many concerns about the importance of Vietnam addressing the serious human rights problems that are taking place in the country still today. And among those is the use of chemical herbicides in the border dispute with Cambodia. What is the Cambodian government doing to address the human rights concerns and the use of herbicides against Cambodia? Thank you for the question. First of all, Regarding the reconciliation and overcoming the legacy of the war, I think myself and particularly he has been uh, elaborating a little bit about it. We have also uh, long time serving, uh, working in this area, Professor Le Kesson, who will be talking with you later on. Uh, the government of Vietnam talking about chemical war, we never had that one. We always respect the human rights issue. We always respect the rules in engaging in the war. And one thing very important here is that if you look back in history, we never wage a war against any country. We wage a war out of our national defense. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I share with you that we need reconciliation and take care of all the victims of the Asian origins, both in Vietnam and in those who have been affected by that. But the, pe the ordinary people have been also affected, not just the veterans. So we need to take care of the ordinary people as well as the veterans. Thank you very much. Okay, Ambassador, thank you very much for your uh, remarks, and I'd like to invite the panel to join me on the stage if we could. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you.
Well, uh, welcome back. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, again, for your remarks. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce the panel, but before I do, um, I'd like to say a word about uh, my colleague, Murray Hebert, who couldn't be here today. He's traveling in Asia. Uh, but Murray um, is uh, our, our deputy director and a senior fellow here at CSIS. He really worked hard with uh, Charles uh, and, and Tim and, and others to put together this program uh, on Agent Orange, and he really believes in the reconciliation process, as I do. But I have to give Murray a lot of credit because he, he really dug hard to, uh, to bring the right people together. I think with Charles Bailey's strong encouragement, uh, Charles, thank you, uh, and Murray both for, uh, for being the inspiration uh, behind putting this together. And I have to, before I introduce the panel, I have to put this in a little bit of context. You know, I, I, we mentioned it before, but we are at 20 years of, uh, of relations in the U.S.-Vietnam relationship. It's 40 years uh, since the end of the, of the war. Um, the general secretary of the party um, is coming to the United States for the first time in early July. Uh, he, um, this visit is historic because no general secretary has ever visited the United States. And um, a reporter asked me yesterday, you know, what's, what's going on here? And I said, and I believe this, uh, that the United States and Vietnam are entering an, a new chapter in our relationship. And, um, and I don't think we could really enter that chapter without addressing the issues that we're going to talk about here today. And I really want to thank the gentlemen who joined me here uh, because um, without addressing these issues, without telling the truth, uh, as the ambassador called it, uh, I think we, we can't move to this, uh, to this new relationship. So let me get to the, uh, the most interesting part uh, of, our, of this panel program and, and introduce our, our leaders here. On my left is uh, Mr. Tim Reeser, who is a Democratic clerk in the Senate Appropriations uh, Subcommittee on State, Foreign Operations, and Related Programs. Anybody who's done Southeast Asia over the last um, uh, 25, 30 years would know Tim. Uh, he has been uh, a stalwart. Uh, pr working to address the truth, I would say, uh, overall, and human rights uh, in specific. Uh, and on this issue, he's obviously had a great uh, partnership with Senator Leahy in, in, in bringing our eyes to focus on the issue. Uh, next to him is Dr. Leigh Le Kaysan, who is the director of the National Research Program on Agent Orange and Dioxin in Vietnam, and he, that's part of the Vietnam uh, Environment Administration. It's wonderful to have him here. Uh, he's a true expert on these issues. And as you've in inferred from the, uh, uh, the senator's remarks and the remarks of the ambassador, uh, the, the man who's really uh, provided a lot of focus and inspiration for this discussion and this event is Dr. Charles Bailey, who was the, um, I think you were the founding um, uh, chairman of the Ford Foundation uh, in Vietnam. He's since joined the Aspen Institute uh, and where he is the, um, the former director on the Agent Orange program uh, in Vietnam. But uh, and anyone who knows anything about this issue knows that um, Charles Bailey has been central uh, to this issue. So I think the uh, batting order, uh, gentlemen, uh, is that Charles will start first and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll talk to Tim and, and Dr. Uh, Son, if we could have, ask you to conclude, uh, that would be great. And then I'll open it up for question and answer and discussion. So Charles. Well, thank you very much. And um, I also want to thank Murray Hebert, who isn't here, uh, for all he did to make this, this happen. Nothing could be done about Agent Orange for um, many years. The issue was truly stuck. And then things began to move uh, in 2007. Dr. Leke Sun here took charge of this issue for the government of Vietnam, and he saw that it was possible to take this complex problem and break it into a uh, part and work first on the more manageable bits. Our then ambassador to Vietnam, Michael Marine, said he felt the United States had a moral obligation, and he made progress on Agent Orange a priority of his ambassadorship. Tim Reeser, working for Senator Leahy, brought patience and persistence to this issue with the Congress appropriating $136 million for Agent Orange in Vietnam to date. As for myself, I provided grant funding to uh, 37 Ford Foundation grantees, both Americans and Vietnamese, 
who worked together to show that Agent Orange is a humanitarian concern that something could be done about. And we can see important progress, as we've heard this morning. In the last eight years, we see active bilateral cooperation in which USAID has played a late leading role. We have moved to more clarity and specificity and to a shared sense of responsibility for a humanitarian response. The Da Nang Airport cleanup is underway and people are being helped. But this progress has been achieved largely by a relatively small number of individuals in both countries working on it year by year. A, further, a full resolution of the Agent Orange legacy by the two governments, however, still lies on the horizon. Senator Leahy talked about recognizing a moral obligation. What would that mean? <coughs> From the U.S. side, a president at some point needs to say, we shouldn't have done that. We shouldn't have done that. We're going to make resolving the Agent Orange issue a priority in our relationship with Vietnam. He needs to put funds for this in the President's budget. If it's in the President's budget, it's a U.S. priority. Right now, it's not a U.S. priority. Of course, the President is not ultimately responsible for appropriations, but if the President wants it, it will happen. As for the Vietnamese, they at some point need to decide that, okay, we now have a strong enough relationship with the U.S that we're going to deal with this last legacy issue. And at that point, they need to say to the United States, you know, our two governments have dealt successfully with so many issues since 1995. Now Agent Orange is the one issue we want to see really our, your priority. And that's about the United States coming to the table with significant money to help our disabled population. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, Tim? I write speeches for other people, but not for myself. <laughs> I, don't even know how to turn the <clears throat> I don't even know how to turn a microphone on. Um, I don't really think I have much to add to what the senator said um, and what Charles and the ambassador said. Uh, this was an issue that needed to be addressed. And uh, I can talk more during the questions and answers about how we uh, came to uh, obtain the funding uh, to do so. It was not easy. Uh, for, a, for over a year, uh, frankly, we encountered real resistance in our own government. And there's certainly a lot more that needs to be done, and I can talk more about that as well. But like most things in, in the government, few, th few things happen that don't reflect the work of other people. And uh, these two people on my left were absolutely indispensable. Without them, we could not have done anything. Uh, again, we have plenty yet to do. We've come quite a good distance. Uh, it hasn't been easy. We need, we need more uh, high-level attention in both governments, frankly. Um, but um, we've accomplished a lot, and I think it has reflected well on our relationship more broadly. So I think I'm going to stop there, and uh, we can talk more uh, afterwards. Thanks, Tim. I'm not going to let you off the hook. I've got some questions, but we'll, we'll move to uh, Dr. Song. Hey, Charles, can you turn your... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am sorry, my English is not good, but I try to speak English with you. Uh, I'd like to thank CSIS and all of you for having this opportunity to discuss here today the Asian Orange issue in Vietnam. Uh, the Asian Orange story has been with me over the last 30 years, and the more I understood it, the more complicated I found it. The Asian Orange issue is complicated because of the complicated scientific nature of dioxin in Asian Orang. And even more complicated because of the viewpoint, approach, and treatment of those who are related to the issue. Uh, the consequences of Asian Orang on human and environment in Vietnam, on US veterans, and veterans of country participating in the war in Vietnam 
is a reality that nobody can deny. The produce of Asian orange and the people who are order, who order the spraying when the story began in the early 1960s could not have visualized and did not want the, the consequences. Why was the story of Asian orange only brought up for discussion between the two governments 30 years after the end of the war? Why until now we have not been able to com complete the clean up of Dyson in Da Nang Airport and have not been able to start treatment of Dyson at the Bien Hoa Airport, even so, the rapid growth, growth of both the city has led um, to large numbers of people living around the contaminated areas. Why are some people reluctant to use the word Asian orange victim? And why children of the exposed war veterans who have birth defects are not seen to be affected by the dioxin in Asian orange? There are many other questions, and I understand for this issue, there are no simple questions and no simple answer either. Uh, the most important thing is not good answer to such question, nor to find a way to avoid questions, but to find how to more speedily treat contaminated Asia in Da Nang Airport and to start sooner to treat using in Bien Hoa in order to stop new damage to human and environment in these areas. We need to find how to ease the pain and difficulties of the exposed people and their children and grandchildren. As long as they are not done, the sea story of Asian orangs in will not be closed. We uh, recently met Vu Huan, the former deputy prime minister of Vietnam. He was an architect of the opening of the relation with the United States. I'd like to quote the former deputy prime minister Vu Huan said, the question is not when the Asian orange issue will be finished. The question is how it is finished and what needs to be done in the relationship between Vietnam and the US. We need an approach to Asian orang that addresses is as a humanitarian, scientific, and responsible subject, and that puts it in the right place in a comprehensive bi uh, bilateral relationship between Vietnam and the US. It will hand, uh, help us organize, imp implement the activities of larger scale and create effectiveness so that we can end the Asian Orange story in a new future. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you all. I'd like to uh, ask a couple questions, and I'd like to ask the audience to think about um, questions that you'd like to see asked. We also are uh, producing this live on, on this live streaming, so if you're in the audience and you have a question, um, please go ahead and send us an email to uh, Southeast Asia program at CSIS.org and we'll try to get your questions. Uh, I'll try to ask your questions of the panelists. Um, and we are, uh, if you're tweeting this program, it's, at, it's live tweeted at uh, hashtag CSIS.live. Sorry, but that's the world we live in. We have to uh, give the social media uh, guidance. I, I think I, I want to start, uh, Tim, with you because you use the fewest words, but where is the resistance? You said it's been hard. Uh, it's been a hard uh, path to get the $136 million that, you, that you've appropriated so far. Um, where is the resistance, and what would you recommend to President Obama that he do in relation to this issue if he visits uh, Vietnam this November, as may, as may be in the works? So I'm not sure the President will be asking me for my advice, but I... Um, That's the fun <laughs> I can say that, you know, initially it was difficult for the reasons that the, se the senator said, that the, uh, the lawyers at the State Department and the Pentagon were very resistant to the idea of any kind of 
of action by the United States that might be interpreted as being reparations or compensation or anything like that. And that's, that's nothing new. It's, it's just um, consistent with tradition. And um, so it took over a year to reach agreement with them that what we were talking about was not either of those things. It was really about trying to work with the government of Vietnam and others in Vietnam to address a problem which we obviously had responsibility for in a way that was going to help further our relations with Vietnam and also was fundamentally a humanitarian effort. And it wasn't a legal issue. It wasn't about admitting some legal liability. It wasn't reparations. It was rather providing training and other assistance and other forms of, of uh, environmental remediation uh, to uh, help both Vietnam but also further our relations with Vietnam. And it actually took quite a while to, to overcome the resistance of the institutions. There's just a natural institutional inertia to things such as this. Um, but once we did, um, then the other issue, um, he alluded to one, which was the fact that there's not been established a causal, scientifically proven causal connection between uh, exposure to Agent Orange and the kinds of disabilities that um, we're all familiar with in Vietnam. And, and so we also had to make the point that we didn't really think it was necessary. That the point was that we had been involved in supporting programs to assist people in Vietnam who were clearly victims of war injuries uh, for years. And we wanted to expand those programs in areas where Agent Orange had been sprayed or where there were serious concentrations of dioxin contamination uh, because we believed that it was quite likely that um, many of those people uh, had been exposed to Agent Orange or had, um, uh, or were the uh, offspring of people who had been. Plus, of course, the fact that we were compensating American veterans for this same type of exposure, um, it seemed, as the Senator described, uh, to be an obvious uh, double standard and, and that the arguments that had been made to us really didn't hold water, uh, given that we were uh, providing assistance to our own veterans. So that whole process, that whole discussion, took quite a while to get past. Um, and then the issue became one which was simply financial. There was no money in the budget. It's not like uh, the administration has ever actually designated funds specifically for this purpose. Um, you know, if, if every year the president releases his budget, all the things that he wants the Congress to fund, and we do our best to try to um, address his priorities, and we also obviously have members of Congress who have their own, um, not to mention others outside the government who um, uh, have an interest in, uh, in the work of the government and how funds are appropriated. But in this case, we have had to find the money. And because it's a zero-sum game in the appropriations process, if you take money from one place, um, or to get money from one thing, you have to take it from somewhere else. So we've basically had to steal money over the years uh, from different places uh, to fund this program. It's not like uh, the administration has budgeted for it. And so that has been difficult also. And it's why it has been a very incremental process every year uh, we find $25, $30 million from whatever source I can, I can um, dig around for. And, um, and that is how we have worked our way over the years, incrementally, to the point where we now have uh, budgeted over 30, $130 million, as was mentioned. But we have quite a ways to go. Uh, the Bien Hoa Airport is, uh, we expect, um, more heavily contaminated than Da Nang. Uh, and it's why the center mentioned we've uh, urged the Pentagon to also uh, contribute to this effort. After all, they had a lot to do with this. Uh, and they should, he feels, uh, recognize that it's in our interest to 
that they are working with the Vietnamese military um, uh, to try to address it. Uh, so, you know, we have, we have to plan for the future. We have to, it, ideally, uh, if the president would include money in the budget, uh, it would make our lives much easier. Um, but at the very least, to when there are opportunities, if the president goes to Vietnam or when the general secretary comes here, to reinforce and re reaffirm the commitment of both countries uh, to continuing to work together on these issues. That, that's, that's almost as important uh, as providing the funds to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is to Charles and Dr. Sun. And, and that is, uh, I wonder if you could share uh, sort of your personal perspectives. You know, what did you learn about the potential for the U.S.-Vietnam relationship in your work on this issue? Is there anything we could learn uh, from, uh, from what you've experienced, what you've seen, what you've done uh, uh, in, our, in your journey to try to address the Agent Orange issue? Any lessons you can share with us? I'll uh, respond and then Dr. Uh, Dr. Sun. Um, I went to uh, live in Hanoi in 1997, and for the next seven years I found it was virtually impossible to talk about this subject in official circles for various reasons that Tim has alluded to. And um, I think it was a real impediment in uh, developing other areas of the relationship. But as we began to see progress after 2007, uh, there was a mutual, uh, there was a kind of virtuous circle instead of a vicious circle. That is, progress on uh, addressing Agent Orange uh, created conditions, uh, positive conditions in other areas and um, vice versa. So that's uh, one lesson. Uh, another lesson is that it's um, possible to uh, tackle um, unpalatable subjects that many people wished had never happened or when they happen, they wish they'd go away and we didn't have to talk about them. But somebody has to come out and talk about it, and in this case, it was valuable that the Ford Foundation and other American foundations were able to um, uh, play a role here as a neutral ground, including an eminent persons group, which was the first free-flowing two-way channel between well-credentialed, well-connected people in both countries where they could talk as individuals and put language out there that made it easier for officials to talk to each other. So those are my two lessons. That's excellent. Thank you. Dr. Sun? So let me speak Vietnamese, and my colleagues hand me to translate. Tôi nghĩ quan hệ Việt Nam và Hoa Kỳ trong lĩnh vực giá kết giá cam ấy, cũng giống như là cái quan hệ chính trị đối ngoại của hai nước trong thời gian vừa qua. Uh, I think that uh, the uh, relationship uh, between Vietnam and the US in dealing with the Agent Orange issue is just like the political relationship between the two countries over the last years. À, có nghĩa là chúng ta có một thời gian kỳ rất là khó khăn và có lúc ấy, thì chất xa cam đi xin vào hậu quả của nó như là trong bóng tối ấy. Uh, meaning, meaning that uh, uh, the, um, we did have a very difficult time in the past just like in the darkness. Uh, tuy nhiên ấy, sau này chúng ta có những cái bước tiến rất là rõ, đặc biệt là sau khi mà bị xóa bó cầm vận. But later on, we did see a very uh, clear movement, uh, in particular after the uh, uh, the removal of the uh, embargo. Uh, có một thời ấy, uh, cái từ chất da cam được coi là cái cụm từ nhạy cảm trong quan hệ của hai nước. Uh, at, at that time the word Agent Orange was seen a very sensitive words. Và năm 2000 ấy, thì có cuộc hội nghị cấp cao ở Singapore của hai bên, nhưng mà hội nghị ấy bị thất bại. In, in 2000, there were a high-level meeting in Singapore, which 
um, ended uh, as a failure. À, mãi đến năm 2005 ấy, thì chúng ta mới bắt đầu có những cái bước tiến đầu tiên. Uh, not until 2005 did we see uh, the first uh, progress. Những cái điều mà chúng ta làm được trong lĩnh vực chất da cam hiện nay ấy, là những điều mà trước năm 2005 chúng tôi không nghĩ đến. Uh, what we have achieved so far in the uh, Asian Orange um, issue uh, was not what we could have thought that we could do it. À, cái tiến bộ đầu tiên ấy là chúng ta đã có những cái chia sẻ thông tin về chất da cam dioxin Việt Nam. The first uh, progress I think is uh, that uh, we could share the information about the A Asian Orange issues. À, sau đó chúng ta có cái hợp tác cùng nghiên cứu về sự tồn lưu của dioxin trong môi trường. After that uh, we had a joint research on the uh, dioxin residence in the uh, environment. Và chính thức xử lý dioxin ở sân bay Đà Nẵng officially uh, treat the uh, dioxin um, contamination in Da Nang Airport. Uh, đặc biệt là cái việc mà chúng ta chính thức uh, có cái chương trình giúp đỡ người khuyết tật, trong đó cả những người mà bị phơi nhiễm của chất da cam dioxin. In particular, in particular uh, um, we officially have a program to support the disabled people that includes the um, uh, people who are exposed to Asian Orange. Mm -hmm. Và chúng tôi đặc biệt cảm ơn ông Shakbali và Ford Foundation ấy, là những tổ chức tiên phong trong lĩnh vực này. Uh, I would like to specifically uh, thank Dr. Charles Bailey and the Ford Foundation who were pioneer in this issue. Và đặc biệt cảm ơn đại sứ Michael Marin là cái người đầu tiên mà tiếp cận vấn đề này trên cái khía cạnh là đạo đức. Uh, and my special thanks to Ambassador Michael Marin, who approached the issue um, as a moral responsibility. Và cái cái sự cái cái việc hợp tác của hai nước ấy, tôi nghĩ khó thành công một cách tối đa như hôm nay nếu mà không có sự trợ giúp của ông Tim Reiser và thượng nghị sĩ Lee. Uh, the relationship between the two countries, uh, the achievement over the past years that we have so far. Uh, couldn't be achieved without the support of Mr. Tim Reiser. Và tất cả những gì mà chúng ta đạt được hôm nay thì tôi nghĩ rằng là cái cơ sở rất là quan trọng để chúng ta sẽ làm tốt hơn chuyện này và chúng tôi mong ấy là sẽ đến một lúc nào đó chúng ta có thể khép cái câu chuyện này lại được. Uh, what we have achieved so far would be a good foundation for us to move forward and I hope that uh, we could soon um, be able to close uh, this issue. This story. Thank you. Those are great answers. I really appreciate it. Let me open the floor to, to your questions. And again, just please identify yourself and, and your institution. The gentleman right here in the front. Uh, my name is Rick Weidman. I'm with Vietnam Veterans of America. Uh, two quick comments. Uh, Mr. Weidman, would you take the uh, mic? Thanks. Two quick comments, if I may. Tim, you really have to beware the causality trap. Association is what you need between diseases and conditions and exposure. And the uh, American Enterprise Institute and others are still trying to wipe out all the gains on toxic wounds for American service people by demanding causality. But it's a, it's a fool's trap. Uh, all of the stuff that we consider dangerous within our society comes back to association. That's number one. Number two uh, is there a question. And that has to do, uh, incidentally, as a follow-on to that, many things are not compensated for American veterans, including birth defects with the exception, small exception, of spina bifida. And there is legislation, which we hope Senator Leahy will gain to co-sponsor, is a hearing tomorrow, S-901, Toxic Exposure Research Act, which is designed for the first time to start researching birth defects and really epigenetics it makes it possible because we believe that it's changing of the acids, uh, etc. Epigenetics didn't exist 10 years ago, basically. And the question is, there was a framework developed as part of the agreement in 2002 following the first ever International Agent Orange Conference held in Hanoi at the Daewoo Hotel. One half of that was to do an ecological 
uh, survey of the whole country with American scientists and Vietnamese scientists working side by side, and EPA was in charge of that. The other side was epidemiological work looking at the people and focusing on the North because you knew who went South and who didn't. Therefore, looking at the progeny of those who went south versus the progeny of those who did not go south and therefore were not exposed to Agent Orange would have been beneficial for American veterans and for uh, Vietnamese. Once again, by association. Um, that has, was abandoned and blown up basically by the Bush administration um, because they wanted to send Bush and wanted the Agent Orange to go away, as Charles Bailey so eloquently said earlier, what is to preclude putting money back into NIEHS during the next 18 months while we have Dr. Linda Birnbaum, who is head of the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences and probably one of the three or four top experts on dioxin in the world. Um, have you thought about making that a priority and looked at that schemata? Let me just say that I, um, you know, I only deal with one piece of the federal budget, and it's the international affairs piece. So we don't fund NIH, for example. Um, I wish we did. There's a lot of money there. Um, so I honestly don't know the answer to the question. I, I, I focus on the amount that we have every year to fund all of our international assistance programs and our contributions to the United Nations and other international organizations around the world and obviously direct funding assistance for governments and uh, a whole myriad of, of programs. But it's all funds that are used overseas, so not by domestic agencies for activities here. But I do think that, you know, I'm sort of interested in your point about association versus causality, because causality has always been the argument that I've run into. And, you know, I, I responded by simply saying, I don't see that that's really an issue here. Uh, we know what happened. Uh, we know that we have a responsibility, both to our own veterans and to people in Vietnam. Um, we know that dioxin is very toxic and, and you know, we could, I suppose, have spent years avoiding the problem and continuing to encounter the kinds of uh, anger and resentment that we did and continued to ignore our own veterans, or we could have done something about it. And I, I wasn't in the military in Vietnam. I, um, I came close, actually. I got a very high number, though, um, in the very last years of the war. Um, but I always felt that what happened there was something that, um, you know, we had a responsibility to address. And uh, so when I've had the opportunity and working for Senator Leahy, I've tried to, to, uh, to do that and um, not to be um, uh, deterred by arguments about legal arguments or, or or others that seem to simply try to defect responsibility or, or come up with reasons why we couldn't do something that clearly we needed to do. Uh, so, you know, I sort of made the same case that whether it was causality or not was not the issue for us. Clearly, we were involved, our people were exposed, they were exposed, there were serious consequences. It's become a huge problem in our relationship we want to move forward. Um, this is an important issue that we have to address, uh, and particularly for someone who lived through that time. Um, it was something that I felt personally about, and so did Senator Leahy. Uh, next question here, the gentleman in the blue shirt. Uh, my name is Scott Allen. I also was in Vietnam, um, and I'm on the board of the Advocacy Project. Uh, thank you very much for all the work that you've been doing. Uh, but my question uh, relates to something that Rick said. Um, it, uh, you know, when the spraying took place, almost all of it was in the South. But the folks that were 
uh, in the jungle and in the in the rural areas of Vietnam that were being sprayed were North Vietnamese soldiers. Many of them lived in those conditions for months and years. After the war ended, they went home. And presumably, they brought the dioxins back. And I wonder if there's been any analysis, any work done to understand the magnitude of Agent Orange in the North uh, compared to the South. I think Charles can answer that more specifically than I, but I can tell you that we were, I wasn't actually aware of that, but I was made aware of that. And so some time ago um, in conversations with USAID, which is administering this program, um, I recommended that they first of all expand it significantly from just uh, in areas where there were designated hotspots to um, a number of provinces that had been heavily sprayed and also provinces where North Vietnamese who had been in the South had returned to, um, like Tai Bin um, near Hanoi, because we recognized exactly what you just said. I don't know the extent of it. I don't know if any studies have been done, but we were made aware that that was an issue that we needed to address and that not only should we focus our attention on provinces that had been sprayed, but also where those who had been in those provinces had returned to after the war. Uh, Dr. Sun, or um, chính phủ Việt Nam ấy, thì đã có một cái chính sách uh, tương đối tốt đối với tất cả những người mà chịu ảnh hưởng của chất da cam đưa xin. Uh, the Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese government has a pretty good programs toward uh, the for policies toward the people who are exposed to uh, Agent Orange. Mà không có sự phân biệt là người miền Nam hay là người miền Bắc và người uh, dân thường hay là người đã tham gia kháng chiến. Uh, without any um, uh, differentiate, differentiation, uh, regardless of whether you are from the south or you are from the north, you are um, the uh, civ civilian or you are in the army. Uh, khi tiêu chuẩn để xác định là người ta có bị phơi nhiễm hay không á, nhưng mà tiêu chuẩn đầu tiên ấy là người đó phải đã sống ở cái vùng bị phun rải hoặc là sống gần cái vùng ô nhiễm nặng. There are criteria to determine whether you are exposed or you are not, but the first criteria is uh, you must be uh, at that time of the spring you are in the in the uh, sprayed area và gần đây ấy, thì chính phủ Việt Nam cũng quan tâm tới những cái đối tượng là đã tham gia chính quyền Sài Gòn cũ ấy, bị phơi nhiễm thông qua các cái chương trình trợ giúp nhân đạo. Uh, and recently uh, in Vietnam there are um, um, new changes. Um, there, there are supporting programs for the people who are, who served in the Saigon Army before, who who were in the spray area. Uh, through humanitarian programs. Với cái trợ giúp của chính phủ Hoa Kỳ trong thời gian vừa qua ấy, thì um, cái số tiền dành cho cái việc giúp đỡ người khuyết tật trong đó có những người phơi nhiễm chất độc da cam đi xin ấy chưa được nhiều cho nên trước mắt ấy, thì chỉ tập trung vào cái vùng mà uh, gần các khu vực ô nhiễm nặng thôi. The uh, financial support from the US government uh, to people uh, who are um, disabled, including the people who are exposed with, to uh, the Agent Orange. The supporting the funding is not uh, very large. That's why we focus on the, um, on the people who live in the uh, uh, sprayed area, who live in the, near the, uh, the hot spots, and yeah. Và sau này tôi nghĩ rằng nếu mà chúng ta có một chương trình lớn hơn ấy, thì sẽ tiếp tục bổ sung các cái đối tượng như là các cái đối tượng từ phía Bắc Việt Nam. 
and I hope that in the near future, in the future, when the, the supporting the fund becomes larger, we would focus more on the people, on the subject of the, the people that we mentioned, people who, who came from the North. À, chính phủ Việt Nam đã coi cái thế hệ con của những người phơi nhiễm bị diệt tật bẩm sinh là đối tượng của chất da cam dioxin và được hưởng chính sách. Uh, but the Vietnamese uh, government, they do um, um, do um, include, they do include the uh, offspring, the children of people who were exposed during the war time uh, in the uh, in the program of Uh, to be entitled to receive support. Và, và bây giờ thì chúng tôi đã thấy cả cái thế hệ cháu grandchildren cũng bị trị tật bẩm sinh. Uh, and now we find that the third generation, the grandchildren of the people who were exposed, uh, they are also affected. Uh, thứ tư. We don't yet have the data, the information about the fourth generation. Nhưng mà chúng tôi tìm thấy những cái biến đổi gen và nhiễm sắc thể ở những cái người mà phơi nhiễm da cam dioxin. But we do find the uh, the changes in the gene. À, nhưng mà chính phủ Việt Nam thì cũng chưa có chính sách đối với thế hệ cháu. Uh, the, Vietnamese, the Vietnamese government, uh, however, doesn't have the policy towards the Uh, grandchildren generation. À, cái lý, lý do chính ấy à, có lẽ là vì kinh tế, bởi vì nếu mà tăng cái số lượng này lên thì cái cái ngân sách của chính phủ Việt Nam không có khả năng để để, để mà trợ cấp. The main reason I think is uh, the uh, the limitation of the budget, the funding, uh, uh, because uh, if we include the third generation in the uh, in the list. The, the budget would become very large. Thank you very much. Other questions? Uh, this gentleman. Ah, here you go. Mark, how you doing? Hi, Michael Martin from uh, CRS. Uh, I'd like to continue a little bit on the same theme, um, which Senator Leahy alluded to, which is I think it'd be reasonable to characterize or overgeneralize, which we try to avoid at CRS, but anyways, that the environmental remediation aspect of the bilateral relationship is going quite well. However, when you get to assistance for health care, health-related issues, disability, there we're experiencing some problems. Uh, Tim, as you alluded to on the U.S. side, resistance to legal liability exposure, but also Congress appropriates funds in a particular way The money goes over to state, goes over to USAID. It becomes a nationwide disability program. So there seems to be some resistance in behavior from USAID and state to having a program associated with Agent Orange and dioxin. On the Vietnamese government side, as the senator alluded to and others of us have noticed, there is sometimes a conflation between individuals who may have medical conditions that could be attributed to exposure to Agent Orange, and individuals who have medical conditions probably unrelated to Agent Orange, and therefore conflation of the affected community. It seems the current structure on both the U.S. side and the Vietnamese side continues to create these problems. Could any of the panelists think of an alternative framework by which the U.S. could provide assistance that would solve the problems on the U.S. side but also at the same time allow the assistance program in Vietnam to reach the targeted people? Well, that is a very good question. And it's one that we struggle with. Um, because obviously we don't have a lot of money. We want to make the best use of it. And you're right that the environmental remediation part is pretty straightforward. You know, it's a complicated process. It involves technology that the Vietnamese don't have. We had to find a U.S. contractor. Uh, it's costly, um, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, you're dealing with decontaminating soil. Dealing with human beings is more difficult. Um, and, and yet, I think that we're largely past the debate about causality, about responsibility, about all of that. Um, both governments are invested in this. 
Um, top U.S. officials have, have um, expressed support for this effort, have committed to continuing to support it, um, have recognized the benefits both to the people of Vietnam and to the relationship generally. So I, I think we're beyond that. Um, what we're not beyond is the limitations of government bureaucracy. Um, and, of course, the funding challenges, which we have not just here, but across the board. Uh, so we struggle uh, to find sufficient funds for all kinds of important and compelling needs, uh, and we, uh, we routinely fall short. So the funding issue is one that we, we deal with um, on a daily basis. Uh, Again, if the administration were to include funds in its budget, that would be enormously helpful. Um, we in, we've encouraged them to do so, but short of that, we, we find the money uh, because Senator Leahy feels that strongly about this. Uh, if he didn't, it wouldn't be there. It's as simple as that. In fact, none of this money would have been uh, uh, available for this purpose. But the issue of how best to use those funds to benefit people the most and the most people um, who were affected or likely affected um, is the challenge. We appropriate money to, to federal agencies. We don't appropriate it to you or to me or anybody else. Um, we can only appropriate money to agencies of the federal government that then enter into grants or other types of agreements with organizations that implement programs. And I think this is where we've seen the biggest difficulty. And part of that is our responsibility, that is AID has its own way of, of doing things which are not always the most cost effective or imaginative. Um, and I think um, uh, some of what we have invested in hasn't been as effective as it should have been. It hasn't involved the Vietnamese to the extent that it should. It hasn't, I think, helped to build more sustainable um, types of programs because ultimately we can't, we can't be the public health service of Vietnam. They have to take care of their own people. Our, our role, I think, is to help them do that, uh, to provide training, technical assistance, other knowledge that we have uh, from our own experiences um, over the years with people uh, with disabilities. And, and there's a lot that we can do to help, but we can't um, fund the health services of Vietnam. So um, we have to make the best use of what resources we have. And um, I think that means working at the local level. It means working with Vietnamese provincial authorities. It means working with community organizations. Um, I think what it doesn't mean is hiring some big contractor from either the United States or somewhere else to come to Vietnam and try to solve the problem and uh, charge an arm and a leg to do it. So it's a work in progress. Uh, we're expanding, as the center has said, our efforts to multiple provinces. We're looking at working at the local level as best we can. One of the problems is finding capable Vietnamese partners. Um, it's not as easy as you might think um, because we also have to be able to account for how the funds are used. Um, and um, there's a real lack of capacity. So um, I think the best thing that we can do is, is be realistic about what we can accomplish, not, um, not think that just by spending money we're gonna solve this problem. Uh, we have to go about it in a way where we are building the capacity locally um, so that um, families can receive the support that they need. Dr. Sun, did you yeah. uh, Tôi cũng công nhận là có cái tình trạng lạm dụng được công nhận là nạn nhân chất giả cảm. Uh, I uh, agree that uh, there are some instances of uh, abusing um, the uh, the the word victim of Asian Orange. Và chúng tôi đã cảnh báo có hệ thống từ trung ương đến địa phương cái việc này. And we did uh, um, alert 
the uh, the low, uh, the governments from the central to the local governments of the problem. À, có mấy lý do để dẫn tới cái việc lạm dụng đấy. There are reasons around this. À, cái thứ nhất ấy, là cái cái bản chất tác hại của đai xin đối với con người thì rất là phức tạp và ngay cả ở cựu chiến binh Mỹ ấy, thì có những bệnh tật mà chúng ta nghĩ cũng không chắc chắn là do đai xin mà có thể do nguyên nhân khác. The first thing is that the nature of uh, determining uh, whether it's a, it's a caused by Agent Orange is complicated and even with uh, war veterans in the US there are uh, diseases that uh, Uh, it's hard to determine it's, uh, if it's uh, associated or not. Cái thứ hai là là đạo đức và ý thức của công dân của những người mà có liên quan. Uh, the second is the, the awareness, the understanding or the knowledge of the people who manage the, the who, who run the program. À, và cái thứ ba là cái năng lực quản lý, cái năng lực nhận biết của cơ quan quản lý mà có liên quan. And the uh, the um, the um, qualification, the uh, the management skills of the of the organization of the departments that run the program. À, và khi bàn đến nhân quả thì vấn đề không chỉ riêng ở Việt Nam đâu, mà ngay cả trong cựu chiến binh Mỹ cũng thế, người ta cũng bàn nhiều đến chuyện nhân quả. And not only in Vietnam, also in the U.S., people talk about the causality. Và vì thế cái việc đầu tiên mà chúng tôi muốn đề cập đến khi mà tiếp cận với những người chịu ảnh hưởng của chất xa cam ấy là nhân đạo. Sau đó mới là khoa học và trách nhiệm. That's why uh, our approach to deal, to solve, to address the problem is uh, uh, we take the humanitarian approach. And then uh, after that comes comes next the uh, responsibility and also scientific um, et, uh, approach. Well, I, oh, Charles, yeah, please go ahead. I have a general and a specific uh, comment. Um, Tim talked about the limitations of bureaucracy, and there is still what I would call foot dragging. Uh, within uh, the State Department and USAID. Um, sometimes I call this that they're still managing a problem rather than seeing this as an opportunity. But we've been able to make it easier within these conditions, and one of them is uh, this definition of dioxin hotspots, which focuses that effort. And uh, last year, some uh, research shows a high correlation between people who have severe mental and physical disabilities in Vietnam and uh, people that are considered to be Agent Orange victims. So it's possible to go to the heavily sprayed provinces and to focus programs on severely disabled people and avoid a whole category of phrases and words in history that is, um, frankly, history. So we're trying to make it easier uh, for both sides. Uh, the second is that when you get down to reality, Uh, down to where people are living as uh, in the centers, uh, the family the center visited, for example, with no offspring. Um, what you can do is um, um, both uh, provide programs that help those families and those communities uh, build family assets. By this I mean uh, physical assets of equipment, uh, better roof, uh, better bathroom, Uh, and scholarships for able-bodied siblings, so when the parents pass away, uh, the family structure can still support these uh, now help, hapless, helpless adults. Um, this needs to go hand in hand with uh, investment in the um, institutional uh, assets, such as training, capacity building. Uh, there's very simple protocol uh, developed by the Washington Consensus on Disability that can be applied to train village council members in Vietnam how to identify the particular kinds of disability and what, to help people qualify for assistance programs. Um, there is also a public-private partnership that has been going on for seven years in Da Nang that shows how you can both 
help people directly while building institutional capacity. It's tough love, in and out, three years, we're done. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think um, today's event really focused on a, a couple things. We, we can see how personal this issue is, how it affects individuals, families, um, and, um, but it has also uh, national and geopolitical uh, implications. And I, and I really want to, and I think the other message that, that, I'm, uh, that struck me is, is what a few uh, people who are committed uh, to try to make something better uh, can do. And I'd like to thank the three panelists here today and ask, me, ask you to join me in thanking them, not only for their comments, but for their work in this regard. Thank you very much.